Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, we're a webinar, we're a webcast, we're an online show. Um, the terminology is up for debate to some people. Um, call us whatever you want. We are Encompass Live, and we're here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We do record the show every week, and it will be posted to our website afterwards. And I'll show you where that is at the end of today's show, so you can go to see where today's recording is and all of our previous ones. Um, in our recordings, we include um, the video of the show, any presentations that are up there that are used during the show, and any websites or links or anything interesting that is mentioned during the show. So you have all of that um, afterwards. Uh, the show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So if you do have any friends or colleagues that are, might be interested in any of our topics, please do share our information with them and have them come and watch some of our shows or watch our recordings. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, uh, book reviews, mini training sessions, demos, um, website tours, um, basically anything library related and any kind of library anywhere you'll have on the show. We're pretty broad. <laughs> this library is really our only criteria. Um, we do have um, Nebraska Library Commission staff that come in and do presentations, um, some Nebraska-centric things, and we do have guest speakers that come in. And this morning we have a mixture of that. Um, today we're going to be talking about the new 2016 um, One Book, One Nebraska title, The Meaning of Names, um, and um, we're going to have some good discussions, some information about what's going on around the state, and I think I'll just hand over to you, Mary Jo, and you can do your introductions to yourself, for yourself and everybody, and take Thank it away. You, <laughs> Thanks. I'm Mary Jo Ryan, and I'm here at the Nebraska Library Commission. I'm the communications coordinator, mm -hmm. and we have a stellar group of people to talk about the meaning of names. Uh, I'm Molly Fisher. I was uh, deputy director of the Humanities Council. Humanities, what is it? Nebraska Humanities. Nebraska now. Humanities now, yeah. And um, I am on the State Library Commission as well as the Center for the Book Board. And I'm Karen Shoemaker, the author of The Meaning of Names. And I wear many hats, I guess. <laughs> I'm just going to wear the hat of the author of The Meaning of Names today. <laughs> I'm Rod Wagner, director of the uh, Nebraska Library Commission, but today I'm here as a reader mm -hmm. and a reader of the meaning of names. Great. Well, <clears throat> I'll just go, maybe. Um, go ahead, Trigan. There we go. I'll just go first and, and just say a little bit about One Book, One Nebraska. Most of the people who are watching the show probably know about One Book, One Nebraska. But our goal is to have Nebraskans all across the state reading the same book and talking about it. And we do this every year. This is our 12th year. Or, yeah, 12th year. Yeah. And um, this year, the book has really captured the attention of a lot of people across Nebraska. We have people reading and talking and book groups. And, and uh, Karen's been out making presentations. So it's been a real great book for the people of Nebraska to talk about. Um, the, a committee of the Nebraska Center for the Book selected this book from a list of titles nominated by Nebraskans from across the state, and the program is sponsored by the Nebraska Center for the Book, Humanities Nebraska, and Nebraska Library Commission. Oh, this is the 12 books I was telling you about. You can see we started our first year with uh, Willa Cather's My Antonia, and this year, The Meaning of Names. And maybe that's what we'll do right now is just move right into the book because I know that's what people are here to hear about. Karen, would you like to give us just a little idea of what the book's about and, and uh, your journey perhaps as the writer of the book? Well, the book is uh, about a German-American farm family in um, uh, central Nebraska during 19, it takes place during 1918 and it involves the anti-German sentiment of World War I and the flu pandemic of 1918. It is based on, the seed of the novel came from family stories, and um, so that it starts with family stories and then branched out to history. I did a lot of research on history of World War I and the flu pandemic. So it encompasses that worldwide history, but comes back to the story of um, this family, the Vogel family in Stewart, Nebraska. And Molly had mentioned earlier about it also as a story of a doctor up there. So I have to say that it's actually a story of a community as much as it is about a family. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
So That's a little the, bit about what the book is about. The first um, time you thought about this story was it because you had heard about something like this or someone told you about a real incident? The, what, the reason I started writing the book is the story, and this is not a spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there is a baby born at the end of the book, and um, that baby and the story of her birth is the story of my mom's birth. And so I grew up as listening to family stories about my mother's um, birth. She, my grandmother had, the whole family had the flu. And the doctor, when he came to the house to deliver my mother, um, whisked the baby. The baby was born, and they whisked her out of the house and mm -hmm. took her into town to uh, a widow to take care of her. They, well, they tried to find a widow. What they found was a woman with children. Um, but... The doctor labeled both my grandmother and my mother a miracle, and that story of how the community came together for this family always intrigued me, so I wanted to tell that story. But when I started to try to tell the story and try to show how um, in the, the emotions behind that and how intense that experience was, I had to sort of branch out and learn more about what the pandemic was and its effect first on each individual community and then on the world. And once you start looking at the flu pandemic of 1918, you go into World War I because the virus actually followed troop lines. So it had a major effect on World War I. Mm -hmm. And from World War I, the anti-German sentiment and the, what's happening in the world. And so um, I just kept researching, which is why it took me eight or nine years to write this book. Because really? I, I would not stop researching. I finally had to put a note on my computer, <laughs> research is not writing. So I, would, I would start writing. So cutting it back to this, the core story of the baby at the end. I, I was curious about your research and your sources. So it's kind of a combination of stories that your family members shared in the acknowledgments, you mention um, uh, many family members, and you said your family is rich in storytelling and listening. So I'm, I'm assuming that uh, a lot of those family stories uh, were inspiration for uh, parts of your book. And, uh, yes. and you mentioned your historical research in terms of the war and the flu. So yes. I was curious about. Uh, because this takes place over 100 years ago, or about 100 years ago, what, what some of those research sources were. Well, the initial research source wasn't, I didn't think of it as research, it's just what we did was yeah. told stories. Sure. And the character Katie in the book, who's an eight-year-old mm -hmm. um, in the book, actually grew up and became a nun and oh. she was my mom's oldest sister. And she spent a lot of time at our house, holidays at our house would visit. and. Mm -hmm. um, I love this woman intensely. But she was a talker. A talker. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, but she's not a talker in the book so much. Not so much. But she was later in life. She probably was when she was younger because that's something you do, but I didn't have that. But um, she was such a talker that I joke with my family that we had a tag team listen. <laughs> and so that's where that kind of came from. Yes. Um, but I was fascinated with stories. I mean, I was a journalist before I became a fiction writer, and so I recorded stories. And I wrote down what she had to say. And the funny thing is, when you become interested in a story, uh, an era, or any topic at all, people start giving you more stories. Mm -hmm. You become a kind of magnet. So um, I had those stories that just came to me before I knew I was going to write about them. And then when I started pulling them together, then other people started giving me stories. So my aunts and uncles, um, I have journals that they wrote and um, papers they wrote for college to give me, you know, they just started, here, you can keep this because we're going to die soon and we need somebody to have it. So my, I have boxes of these things. And then that's true of strangers too. They find out that somebody's interested and they have these documents. They want something to happen to them. They don't want to, that they don't want to just throw away. They want something to happen. So people would give me information. So I had a lot of, um, source materials that actually came from people writing of, of that time, in that time, not just mm -hmm. um, historical looking back. It's how it looked from that position. So I was really fortunate in that. Yes. And that's did, where a lot of it came from. Did your family experience anti-German sentiment? Um, I don't have any family stories of anti-German sentiment. Um, I do know in the communities there was that 
anti-German sentiment. I don't have it explained. What I have is my grandfather, um, I knew him as Fred. So he changed his name from Fritz to Fred. So I know that there must have been something that caused him to make that change in his name. Mm -hmm. And um, he was drafted. And mm -hmm. uh, according to the records of draft, um, he should have been exempt. I mean, he was almost too yes. old. He was a German. I mean, he was a farmer. He was the breadwinner. He had children. He had all the, these check marks for exemptions from draft, but he was drafted. And uh, the flu actually kept him home. So that was one of Katie's stories, or Sister Amater, as I knew her. That was one of her stories. So she didn't talk about it as anti-German sentiment. It was just what happened during that time. And it was only after I started researching what the attitude was at that time that I realized this was, this was why these things happened. I found out what happened, but it was research that helped me understand why it happened. And did you um, do library research or historical societies or anything like that as well? I did. I spent days and days and days, long days. As a matter of fact, I got very many parking tickets because I wanted <laughs> get to leave the historical society. <laughs> so I read newspapers. They're all on my, the yeah. Nebraska newspapers are all on microfilm. So I read the um, newspapers from 1918, 1917 and 18. And um, so I read Nebraska papers, but I also read... Um, in various sites, you know, the computer's a great thing, but um, I went as much as I could go to sites to research, but there was still, I depended a lot on um, things I could find on the internet about what happened elsewhere. And then I had read, I read, um, you know, I read books on the flu, which I should have brought the, the, the list of books, but the flu by Gina Colada, and then there's a great pandemic of 1918 by a man who wrote a really good book, but his name won't come to me right now. <laughs> yeah, we'll come later. <laughs> yes. um, it's, it's available, actually. I've seen it in libraries when I've traveled, so it's available. But I read a lot about the flu and read about World War I, just historical books because they interested me. So um, I did. And then there was on hands-on kind of research. I went to museums and handled things. If you want to know what a character is feeling, you really need to know literally what they're feeling. So my grandmother would never have known what this bottle felt like. Yeah. Um, because it's plastic. She didn't, it didn't exist. And mm -hmm. so you go and find out what did exist and what they touched. And so you sort of go inhabit their lives as best you can. Isn't that an amazing thing? Yeah. Yes. That's pretty cool. It is. Are some of the incidents in the book based upon actual, like the young man getting thrown off the train? Uh, the priest uh, who gets after the doctor for his beliefs, but also, you know, refuses to look at what might have been your mother. Right. <laughs> and, um, oh, I mean, there are just several incidents uh, where, well, and I'm sure this actually happened where rumors got started that, the Germans dropped something over here to cause the flu, <laughs> right? And that right. I'm sure that's true, right? Yeah. Yes, that's those are that is true. Uh, those were taken from newspaper accounts, the things that people were saying, and so you know I pulled the things that people talked about, and I took some of the rumors you you pull from those diaries that I said I had, yeah. but some were actually published. They were editorials, in um, especially East Coast papers had a lot of them. So um, that would, those kind of things were true. The, um, two directions on that. You ask about the um, man on the train and the doctor, and there are two separate answers to that. So I'll, the man on the train, actually, the interesting story to me about the man on the train is that when I was doing this research, I knew about how violent anti-German sentiment had become all over the country, but I didn't believe it had happened in Nebraska mm -hmm. um, because as we had talked earlier it's there were so many Germans in Nebraska that we wouldn't turn on ourselves kind of thing so when I was researching I, I couldn't see it happening in Nebraska but I saw it in Missouri there was a man drug off a streetcar and yeah. drug through the streets wrapped in an American flag and um, the people who did it uh, didn't get charged with anything because the judge said he shouldn't have been speaking German in the first place. So I knew that there was really horrible things happening very close to Nebraska, but I didn't see it happening here <clears throat> until one day I was going back through the notes I had taken from the newspapers, and I found in my own handwriting the story of this man from off the train, that I had written it down 
but didn't let it enter my uh, consciousness in some way. And that, that intrigues me, that we see what we expect to see, and no matter how close we are to it, we can't see what we don't expect to see. And it wasn't until I saw it, a few weeks after writing it down, that I thought, oh my gosh, that's in the Nebraska newspaper. And I had to go back to the newspaper, and then I started seeing it. Then I could see what was happening in Nebraska. And it did happen in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I stayed true to the, not the facts of Nebraska, but the tenor of the mm -hmm. truth in it. And so that man who was thrown off the train, that's a true story, but I don't, don't have a grandmother who witnessed it, and it's a, it's a dramatization of the kind of things that happen. And some of the quotes are directly from newspapers, so that's very true. So, so that's the answer on the, um, the guy on the train and it's several of the other things. But then there's other things that are full plot uh, imagination, and the doctor and the priest stem from that. One of the challenges of writing a book about a family that lives on a farm in 1918 in north central Nebraska without a phone and without access to newspapers is that you have this very closed community, but there's all this stuff going around them that I want the reader to know. So I had to bring in characters who could then inform the readers and interact with these people. And I know there was the doctor, I know there was the priest, etc., but I created them um, to to help dramatize this story. And they weren't really intended to be that big of a part of the story, but uh. as I've said, I, I just kept, got a crush on the doctor and I kept writing about him. He was a cool guy. Yeah. I liked him too. Yeah. And he just kept saying interesting things, so I kept writing them down. <laughs> yeah, they kind of, of course, take over, uh, don't they? <laughs> they do. For the librarians in the group, he was committed to helping start a war library. Yes. And we also appreciated that you mentioned Charlotte Templeton, an early uh, head of this agency back at that time. So. Yeah. That One of our four mothers is mentioned in the book, <laughs> Charlotte <laughs> Templeton. Yes, yeah. yes, that was a fun piece of information to come across, that yeah. war fund. And there was a lot of that. You know, what, what my characters say was part of the tenor. I don't have anybody who really said that. I don't know anybody who really said those. But that's what happened in different communities is yeah. some communities really wanted the war fund to get books to our soldiers. That didn't turn out so well, though, did it? <laughs> no, not so much. Yeah. And part of it had to do with that, that some people were concerned what they would learn. Yeah. So, Learning is a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> in some people's minds, I guess. Yeah. Uh -huh. I had another question. Let's see. Uh, what about the the theme of death, I guess you would say, which starts the book but ends the book in life? And um, also how that relates to the whole family core. Because, of course, in the book, Gerda loses her older sister. And that nightmare stays with her, but the nightmare also translates to the doctor who dreams about snakes and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, so, was that kind of a unifying? Um, I, I'm not sure if this, what I will say next, has anything to do with what you just asked, but I'm going to take a stab at it. <laughs> I didn't really set out to write about death as a theme. But I knew about my grandmother. I, she died when I was in sixth grade, so I didn't get to know her as a person. But um, through Katie or Sister Mater, I did know, because um, she told me many times, my grandmother's greatest fear was losing a child. She had 11 of them, and she, um, she died before any of them died. So um, she didn't have to bear that burden of losing a child, but I knew she was terrified of it. And um, so when I was creating this character, I was trying to imagine what that meant to be so afraid of losing a child and why she was afraid of it. And in my research, I, um, our genealogy research, my grandmother did lose a sister. And I don't know that she died in childbirth, but she died um, about nine and a half months after she got married. So in a time when um, there was no you just start bearing children as soon as you start um, come of age. Um, so I knew that that was uh, 
a fear of hers. And so I wanted to do what was what was motivating her throughout the book. What what how did she live her days? And so when she got pregnant, I knew that would be a time when she would be most afraid of it. Mm-hmm. Um, the but the book starts with a death of a woman in childbirth. That was not originally um, in one of the. It, it was it was a late working draft to put that at the beginning, and part of it had to do with um, when I had one of the readers that um, I sent it to. She was a young woman, and it wasn't. I had that scene in which Elizabeth dies in childbirth, <coughs> probably two thirds of the way through the book. And when she came to that, she said, "If I had known that before." I would have been terrified with Gerda instead of just when I get here, I was yeah. so shocked by it because she was a young woman and she didn't realize how dangerous childbirth was to women. Mm-hmm. And so it sort of set the stage for what was really at stake and how closely, how close mortality was in this moment of life. And so I moved it there so that we could look at the ways in which they're so closely yes. tied. So that is. Okay, good. I took a good stab at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, any? I was curious about um, in all of the many uh, presentations and discussions you've had with people about the book, uh, uh, have there been any surprises in terms of peop- of how people have reacted to this uh, your book? Uh, um, I imagine they've shared their own stories because they relate to, from family, um, relate to uh, experiences they've had. I don't know if, if it's surprise, it's delight how many people do exactly what you just said, mm-hmm. which is connected to their own stories and their own families. Yeah, I know I did. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I was surprised because you know I kind of felt I was when you're when you're writing a book, you're in this little world and you think it's it's never going to really um, connect with people. And oh, so when yeah. it does, um, it's so mm-hmm. delightful. And um, early on, uh, when I would go to bookstores, I would have people come and they would buy one person would buy like five or six books because they had that many siblings. Mm-hmm. And the, the great thing about it wasn't just that they bought a lot of books, but what, telling about how the book itself became an impetus for people to start talking to one another about things they had never talked about before. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, that's the surprise and delight is that people yeah. talk to one another about their own families. Yes. You know, and so that would be the mm-hmm. best part about it to me. In talking about their families, do they talk about the relationship of fathers and daughters and in relation to this, or is it more about what happened at that time with their family? I think I get some of both. A lot of people, the um, Frank Drieke is the grand is Gert's father in the book, and um, he he comes off as a bad guy in the book. I mean, he wanted to, wanted to control Gerda. He wants to be in control of everything. And he comes off quite um, negatively. And I've joked several times that when I cross over to the other side, I'm afraid my great-grandfather's going to be standing there with his hands oh. on his hips. <laughs> <laughs> you made me look really bad. <laughs> and I don't know that he was bad. I do know it was true that he labeled my grandfather uh, an armateufel. And, um, but that interests people, how the, how a negative family story comes down. So it's not mm-hmm. so much my specific story, but they're interested in how, the, how these stories trickle down. Mm-hmm. So people do bring that up quite a bit and then talk about, it's, it's, it's one of the stepping off points for people to talk about their own family. Mm-hmm. And so that's how that one works quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Though, Great Grandpa Drake, you might be mad at me for it. <laughs> oh, a writer's got a lot to atone for. <laughs> this side and the other. <laughs> well, Molly uh, was interested in the name of the book, the meaning of names. And I think you had some thoughts about that and maybe wanted to read a section that might help illuminate that or... Yeah, I'll read a section, and I've not ever read this at a reading because it's kind of disjointed um, a little bit, so I'm going to try to wing it through reading it. Um, It takes place in the middle of the book, or close to the middle, and it's um, 
Gerta has um, been <coughs> writing with her, writing letters to her sister, and as a result, she builds a relationship with uh, the mailman who brings the um, the mail. And this is a scene in which um, kind of helps explain where the theme of the title comes from. Early spring was her favorite time of year. A flock of finches littered the calf pen, scavenging for seeds or worms. The jangle of buckles on her boots scattered them as she approached, and they disappeared into the trees lining the drive. They came back every year, robins, jays, finches, all the birds, all part of the cycle of seasons. Nothing to get excited about, but still the sight of them made her happy, gave her hope. Sentimental nonsense is all it is, she chided herself. Still, she felt uplifted by the sight of the small birds and the whistle of the meadowlarks. She walked slowly, watching her feet when she got out onto the lane, taking care not to slip into the muck, and she was almost to the mailboxes before she realized the mail wagon was still there. She looked up and smiled at the man leaning against the backboard of his wagon. Good afternoon, Mrs. Vogel, Charlie Burke said with a slow smile. You're a fine sign of spring. She blushed and looked away. You look like a great bird coming down toward me, coming toward me down the lane, Mrs. Vogel. He held a stack of mail out to her. Gerda told herself not to notice the way Charles Burke's smile spread slowly across his face. She told herself the dimple on his chin was no concern of hers. She kept her head tilted down as she looked at the stack of mail in, in his hand. It's the way the wind caught your dress, I mean, he went on. It looked like wings. He spread his hands and arms out at his side in imitation of her. Or maybe it's an angel you remind me of. Gerda felt her cheeks warming and she pressed her lips together to keep from smiling. Bird, she said abruptly. That's what my name means. You know, in German, Vogel means bird. And I'll skip ahead a minute, a page. Gerda shook her head at him in the same way she did when her children misbehaved. What does your name mean, Mr. Burke? Burke? I don't really know. It's just a name, an American name. Gerda's face froze, smile froze on her face. How quickly the tenor of a moment can change. Of course, Gerda thought. American names were enough in themselves. Only immigrants had names with two meanings. To be an American, your name was just your name, and that was enough for America. Wow. So that's um, the title, um, original working title of the book was um, This Is Now, because I wanted because I'm a teacher as well, and I was kind of <laughs> pedantically pounding the theme in that it's not just history, it's something that continues. The things that are happening then happen now, and these are people who have flirtations and um, who have the same concerns any one of us have in a lot of ways. But this is now, when I took the book to a pitch conference, how to pitch the book to publishers, they said, this is now is a stupid title, so get rid of it. <laughs> so I got rid of it and went to the book. I followed the lead of my poet friends, uh, that they look to the poet, the poem, to help you see what the name title of the poem is. And I went back to the book and opened it up. And oddly, it was to that page um, that, and I thought, well, there you have it right there. So that's where the title and the theme of the title came from. And the bird imagery, especially in that scene, you see it in other places. Um, that was not a, it never intentional. I never put that together intentionally. It's just that I live in Nebraska and those kinds of experience, the sounds of birds in the spring and mm -hmm. the like are, mm -hmm. and the wind. So we all know um, wind. the wind in Nebraska is always present. So. And I think that that passage that you just read also points out another thing about the book, which are the amazing descriptions of place. You know, that I think is is kind of overlooked because the story is so powerful. But there's all these descriptions of the place that are so good. And part of it maybe, I don't know, is it because it still looks like that? <laughs> but or or you grew up there? I mean, I don't know. I guess I'm asking that question. Um, but how do you immerse yourself in that place to get those descriptions so true? Well, part of it, the, the land is still very, um, very much like that. But, you know, I'm going to back away from that statement. It's not very much like that. If you go up into this area, um, 
you'll see that most of these pastures that I would have been familiar with um, have become cornfields, and so we, we're we're much more a plowed community. But that really didn't start. That kind of mass planting of Nebraska um, started more in the 80s um, when farms really took off. The family farms were disappearing, and um, the field, fields got bigger. But I grew up in the um, 60s and 70s, and I spent a lot of, both my grandparents had farms in Holt County, and I spent time there, and I'm, I'm an introvert, and so I love just being by myself, walking through the field. So I spent a lot of time just being in that landscape, and I loved it. I mean, I've traveled quite a bit, but I still think Nebraska is just really one of the most beautiful places. Yeah. When it's beautiful, it's just there's no match for it. Um, so I loved the place, so it makes it easy to um, to d describe it as something beautiful because that's how I see it, as something beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have a lot of sense memory from my own youth about mm -hmm. what those things were like. And I think that it, it's true of any story, or, or a lot of stories. Sometimes you could, any story, some stories can be any place and some stories only occur there. Mm -hmm. And this may have happened a lot of places, but the land <clears throat> actually had an effect on these characters. Mm -hmm. And so bringing that into the story so that you could feel, I wanted you, you know, you would feel that isolation, you would feel that sense of reprieve that um, Gerta felt in that scene where that she comes out in spring and that sense of you can breathe again. Yeah. I think that's a big part of what mm -hmm. the characters' lives were like and what the story needed. Uh, that actually leads into a question that somebody from the audience just has asked just now. Um, while you were talking, um, they wanted you to talk about the cover, the looming clouds. Is that, well, I don't know if that was something you had any decision making in, or is that the clouds of war, of the pandemic, or Nebraska? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, this is one of the things that I, I, I can say without any reserve that this is an absolutely gorgeous cover. <laughs> I didn't have <laughs> anything to do with it. So I can say that Mark Cole, the publisher and cover um, designer, did a great, great job. I love this because it feels to me what the book is about. He really got what the book was about, was that sense of ominous, we all know that storm coming at us. Mm -hmm. So it could be the... Um, it could refer to the pandemic, the flu, or any number of things that are coming at you. When I um, talked to the publishers about the cover, um, I was told up front that authors have no voice in the cover. This is something that's decided. So when we send it to you, say yes. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or and So I was very happy when they sent this to me. But because I know them, I, I teach with one of the publishers at, at the University of Nebraska's MFA in writing program. So I teach with her, so I, I had a little bit of an in that I could at least interject what I thought would be on it. And I talked mm -hmm. about the cover. One idea that I had for the cover was a kind of Dr. Zhivago, snowy plains kind of thing with a train mm -hmm. moving across it. And so we did think about that mm -hmm. sort of thing because it showed the showed a lot of the, what the, the themes of the book, that isolation, the cold, that uh, the civilization, uh, via the train. So I had a lot of reasons why I thought that would be great, but we couldn't find a really good train picture. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if I can't have a train, then I want it to be the sky. I think mm -hmm. that uh, it needs to be the sky mm -hmm. to be a Nebraska story. Mm -hmm. And so they sent me a number of, they did let me have some um, input because they had no idea really what um, Nebraska would look like in 1918. And if you get a magnifying glass out, you can see that we, we don't have the right fence posts for 1918. Oh, really? <laughs> and I think wow. off in the end, oh, no. somewhere in the back, you can see some bales mm -hmm. on one of the scenes, or in one of them, you can see that. Um, oh, yeah. Maybe so yeah, I, right. but I was just that picky. <laughs> so they had to actually, I, I had to make a case that you can't have round bales in the picture. No. Because it was, you, yeah, right. Was and, uh, yeah. and the, I was a little iffy about the road because roads, even mm -hmm. Highway 20 was just a dirt road. And I'm pretty sure it didn't have this much of a foundation. So, but I was that picky, and they said, "Oh, just stop." <laughs> and I agree. It's I great. think it's a great picture. So, and it does definitely, for those of us that are from here, have driven across the state, 
it just screams Nebraska. I mean, yeah. I see yeah. that. Oh, yeah, of course. I think I've been there probably at some point. <laughs> and I like the, the way the questioner, uh, whoever it was, said, what are those clouds? Because mm -hmm. you do wonder. I mean, obviously, they're a, it could be a winter storm. Maybe mm -hmm. fall, looking at the picture again. But, you know, there's also, like you say, the forces coming in, the flu, the attitudes to our, our, towards our community, what community means. I will tell you a funny story about Mark, who designed the cover. He's an engineer, and, um, and I, I love Mark. So if he, were, if he hears this, I want you, and this is sincerely, I like him a lot. But he's a, he's a nerd about some things. <laughs> and what he did with the, this, he manipulated the clouds for a while to make them form just subtly the... Um, the symbol for the virus, the flu virus, oh. <laughs> and and oh. they looked at it and said, no, that's mm. too obvious. <laughs> mm. let, let people decide for themselves what yeah. those clouds mean. Yeah. So actually, the question was really good, good because yeah. Mark did want it to be the flu, and um, I think that was him just messing with it. And actually, the actual clouds of Nebraska were enough without enough. the. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think you did a good job with the isolation too, because I, you know, they were. She was only 150 miles from her family, but it was she hadn't been to see them in a number of yeah. years and a world away, world yeah. away. Yeah. The other thing, their was, prosperity, yeah, versus the yeah. struggle that she and her husband and family were having. Yes. Other thing I was going to say is that I think that this is such a timely book because we live in a world today where names make such a difference. And people are judged by their names mm -hmm. so often. Yeah, there were. Uh, there's a lot of different um, connections that you can see that we're struggling with as a community mm -hmm. and as a country, as a world today. Um, and that's why I, I said that the working title was "This Is Now" because I wanted. That's that's one of the things I knew was happening. When I was doing research on the book, I came upon upon that um, sauerkraut became. Liberty Cabbage and Hamburgers Became Ground Beef Patties. I found that in a, um, in a Nebraska newspaper. So that's a story that really came from mm -hmm. our history. And the, the summer I found that information was the summer we were all eating Freedom Fries. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, I mean, it's, it's the parallels are yeah. so close. And it's true of the, the names. So it's... Um, yes. <laughs> yes is the answer in so many words. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are so many connections. And I think that's also part of why it resonates with people. It's a safer way to look at it, for one thing. It's easier to understand what's happening if we're distanced from it and then apply it mm -hmm. to what we're suffering now. Then it's, um, so I think that's one of the reasons why it, it feels timely but removed enough to understand. Mm -hmm. And for this reason, I think it'd be such a great book for young adults to read. I, I don't know if you've heard, I know adults are reading this book. And I just didn't know if you'd heard whether younger people are as well, you know, high school students. And I um, have had a couple of a couple of teachers who have, high school teachers, I've gone to visit um, uh, high schools here in Lincoln, Southwest High School, and she brought in um, teachers from other high schools. So I met a lot of high school teachers and librarians. And... They're talking about it with students and um, using paragraphs from it to go try to um, explain the history as well as um, language um, writing uh, coherently, I guess, and writing descriptions. So I know high school students are one. I had mentioned this earlier about a teacher, high school teacher in Illinois, had sent me a note saying that she read the entire book out loud to her senior class. And I love that idea that somebody sat down and read the book to kids. I don't know if the kids would have read it, but they had to sit and listen to it. So, yeah, we thought it would be an awfully nice thing if someone would read out loud to us. <laughs> Which is why it's such a great thing. Your book is now on audible.com. Yeah. Yeah. iTunes and Amazon, you can go and listen to me read. <laughs> Which would be great. So, but yeah, I think that as a high, it, it's, it is a way of bringing history um, in. Just it has all of the um, historical aspects, so that the history they're learning in history classes. Can
can come alive. That's how I learn is through stories. And um, many people learn through stories. So Absolutely. And it's, an, it's a pretty simple story. It's a small book. And, um, you know, it, it is only as complex as you make it. And so I think that for high school students, if I had just made Katie a bigger character, then I could call it a YA book. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yes, yes. It's all in the way you do it. <laughs> um, if there's anyone in our audience that has a question for Karen, I know that some of you have microphones, and all you have to do is ask Krista to unmute, unmute your yep. microphone. I can do that. Or you can just type the question right into the question box. Mm -hmm. We do have one other question. Um, also, that first one came from our, we have some of our staff here meeting, watching the show elsewhere. <laughs> um, someone wants to know if this is your first book of fiction, or if you've got other ones, or if you have plans for others. That you've I have, made it through the years of writing this one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I have a short story collection that came out in 2002 called Night Sounds and Other Stories. Mm -hmm. I believe that's a Nebraska it's book award winner. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It is. So you guys have been good to me for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> You've been good to us. Yeah. It's a mutual admiration society. <laughs> so I have um, that short story collection. I have a couple of novels um, that I've written. Um, some are just, they will probably stay in the desk for one. I'm hoping, I keep hoping I'm going to finish I said I would have it at the end of last year, but I didn't. But I have a book that I'm sure I will finish in the next year called The Last Living Waitress of the Home Cafe. And it's historical only in that it takes place before the internet. And um, it's about a, uh, again, it's a community story based up on a young girl who grows up in a small town in Nebraska. Oddly enough, I can't get out of Nebraska. Um, <laughs> But uh, she leaves home and ends up in a girly magazine, and it's the effects of that kind of thing on a uh, on this community and her family, and the like. So, so it's more than that, but that's as big, good a spiel as I have. That sounds like a very interesting yeah. story. Yeah. I keep thinking the title. Just I have to keep writing till I get a book to go with the title. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great title. Yes. That's a great title. Well, Karen, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about, I know um, you've been going around doing presentations for book club groups and presentations in libraries and museums. Have you learned anything new about Nebraska? Or um, I don't know. I don't know. I learn something all the time from people. Um, I've learned that Nebraska is really, really a big state. Yes, it is. <laughs> sure. um, and some roads are better than maintained than others. But um, I've really enjoyed going around and um, to libraries. I spend a lot of time visiting uh, libraries. I've been going to book clubs since the, the book was, um, I don't know if you said this earlier, it was the Omaha Reads selection in 2014. And at that point, a lot of um, because of the public libraries, uh, Omaha's public library promotion, I spent a lot of time in Omaha um, going to different book clubs and visiting book clubs in Lincoln and Omaha area. And what the biggest surprise is how many book clubs there are in this in this town, in this mm -hmm. state. Yeah. They're alive and well. Um, people are reading, getting together and reading books and have been mm -hmm. um, regularly. So I've visited, um, I'm 60 to 70 book clubs since the book came out. So uh, the big surprise, I, I learned that people love books and want to talk about them. And I'm really delighted about that because there's always this fear that the uh, people are only watching movies or something. But um, I, I have found that people are reading books and talking about them, and I do love that. In these book clubs, have you had any of them, because they're small groups, have you had anybody say, well, I didn't like this little thing that happened? <laughs> Why did you make that happen to her? I'm mad at you about that. <laughs> no, fortunately, most people are, are really kind, and especially when you're one-on-one. -on -one. They might be saying that behind my back, but they, they're very kind to my face. I did have a few people um, ask me if I chickened out at the end and kept them alive because I couldn't bear to kill them off. Mm -hmm. And I um, said, no, I, 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 
I, I kept them because they did leave, live. And so there was that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, there are... Um, I want to know who else survived the... You know, because I... I don't know if if I if he's saying here I've missed it, but like the the mailman and um, there's several several people. Everybody seemed to have it. For You're me. starting to care about those uh, <laughs> ancillary yeah. characters, there, Molly. Well, how did the <laughs> doctor mean, avoid the flu? That, that, yes, that's, that's always an amazing that. thing that that people some people got some it people. and some people didn't. So, yeah. um, but you know. Um, I'm not sure if, because one of my books has to do with some of these characters, I'm, I'm reading a book, or reading, I'm reading many books, but I'm also trying to write too, and one is that last living waitress at the home cafe, and the other is uh, sort of, uh, it's not a follow-up, it's not a sequel, but there are people from it, from mm -hmm. this book, the move into the other, um, and so I know about what happens to some of them, because I've um, oh, work okay. on it. So well, I'm, we better have that sequel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I wrote faster. Because <laughs> I want to know what happens to them, too. <laughs> well, this is a pretty good segue, I think, into... Let's see if I can get this slide to advance. Go ahead, Dragon. Ah, there we go. I just wanted to point out that all across Nebraska, we do have people engaging with this book all the way through 2016. We're halfway through right now. And um, our book club kits are actually booked through, and it says March 2016, but that is wrong. It's actually March 2017. Oh, wow. We've got book club kits booked into next year because people are, are really excited about this book. Um, I just want to um, remind you that if you go to onebook.nebraska.gov and check out news and events, you can see where Karen's going to be in the next few months, where she'll be visiting uh, libraries and book clubs. And you can also uh, see any kind of press about things that are going on having to do with the book. And you can borrow, oh, excuse me, you can join the conversation on Facebook. We have, um, and, and Krista, if you will... Oh, send me to my Facebook page. It's down. Oh, well, yeah, that'll work too. There to open it up. Yeah, yeah, that's even better. Um, you can see that we're we've got a lot going on. We are trying to keep track of Karen on Facebook and share a variety of different things. This is just a trailer which starts automatically. Sorry about um, the the show that we're watching right now. Which I see 511 people, people reached, yeah. reached with the trailer. Interestingly, only 107 of them looked at the trailer. So I don't know how don't it know. does those statistics. I don't um, either. I don't understand the statistics at all. But hey, it's all interesting. So uh, do join us on Facebook. Like us, please. And that way you'll get our posts. And um, also just uh, let us know what you're thinking and let us know what you're reading and, mm -hmm. and what, your, what, what your book group is reading and what they think about the book. And Chris, I'm sorry, you'll have to send no, me back. the PowerPoint. There we go. Okay. And um, I would want to suggest that all of you consider scheduling a book club or a book talk in the library. You know you can book a program with Karen through the Humanities Nebraska Speakers Bureau, which is a terrific resource, resource in our state. They are helping to sponsor One Book, One Nebraska, and they can make it very easy and inexpensive for you to have Karen come to your town soon. You do have to schedule it with Karen, though, yes. so you make sure it's, it works for her. Um, I'd also like to suggest to librarians specifically that are watching this show that you offer to appear on your local radio and TV talk shows and talk about One Book, One Nebraska and talk about the books that are resonating in your community. Um, we also have a video that you'll be able to show of Karen speaking, and, and we hope to make that available on YouTube, and that way you can screen that for your board, maybe, or another group that you have in your library. And then any other ideas you have for programming, we're open to hearing about them, and so please let us know what you're doing in your communities. And a reminder that Karen will be back with us here in Lincoln on October 29th. Um, we'll have the Celebration of Nebraska Books at the Nebraska History Museum, which is here in Lincoln on Centennial Mall North. It's a fabulous event. We have a great time. It starts um, at 2.30, ends around 6.30, so you don't have to give up your whole Saturday to it. 
but it's a lot of fun. We have a program from Karen on uh, One Book, One Nebraska. We'll be honoring our Nebraska Book Award winners for this year, and they usually they usually provide about a is that about a five minute five to ten minute reading. Five to ten. So if you have favorite Nebraska authors, you just might get to hear them read as well. Um, we will actually announce the winners of the Mildred Bennett and the Jane Geske Award and what book we're going to be talking about next year on One Book, One Nebraska. So we have a little reception and book signings. It's really a lot of fun. So join us if you can here in Lincoln on October 29th. Oh, and I was supposed to show you this slide when I was talking about all that. <laughs> and for more information, you can always contact me. You can contact tessa.terry at nebraska.gov as well. You can call me. You can go to our One Book, One Nebraska uh, website or our Facebook page. Other thoughts or things you'd like to share for the good of the group? Any last questions from the audience? Maybe have any last minute questions while you've got us all here. <laughs> Type in your questions, time. ask what you want to. Um, is anybody already have has anybody already had events at their libraries that they want to talk about? I don't know if anybody's already done things. Well, there have been quite events. a few events, but I don't know if any of the people in our audience have been involved in, a, in any of the events. Karen's been she's been busy. It's been a busy six months. It has been. And then some. <laughs> Um, I will say one of the things about the presentation, if you've been to one presentation, they're not always the same thing because I, did, I, uh, I, I put it over to the, the um, audience. So the, whatever presentation I make, it's your group, their interest is what we talk about. Mm -hmm. So it's always a little bit different, um, each presentation. So that's, that's important to, to know that you don't have to listen to me say the same thing, though I will tell a lot of the same stories because I am my Aunt Katie's daughter. Right? <laughs> <laughs> talk and talk. Oh. <laughs> Tag team listening. I love it. <laughs> so, yeah, we're we're actually looking forward to um, the October 29th event because we haven't been back to the History Museum, the Nebraska mm -hmm. History Museum, mm -hmm. for several years. We've been doing that event here in the Library Commission, so we're going back to the Nebraska History Museum. And they've just been remodeled, and we have kind of a new, exciting space to work in. And so Karen will be there, nice. and it'll be very nice. It'll it's be a fun. good event. And it's always fun to hear who won the Nebraska Book Awards. Yes, mm -hmm. and I'm sure always happy when they talk come. About it. Yeah, to talk about it exactly. I love that. So. Doesn't look like anybody has any desperately urgent questions. Okay, well they, they can, can always so. <laughs> uh, they can always check in with us. There's an email address up there. They can always check in if they have additional questions and contact Karen if you're interested in working with the humanities grant to bring her to your town. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All, right. All right. All right. Then I guess that will wrap it up for this week's show. Um, this week's Encompass Live. Um, Switch over here. And there we go. And Mary Jo, since you have the keyboard, if you could help oh me. Oh my just, gosh, just, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Just type in um, Encompass Live. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for attending, um, everyone in our audience. And thank you very much, Karen, for being thank here with us today. It was great to be able to thank talk you to you and everything. Um, what? It didn't work. <laughs> Sorry. You want the other slideshow down there on that PowerPoint? Oh, I know you want to talk about what's coming yeah. up, and I can't get you Put there. Put a space in. Ah, there, there okay. you go. It matters, the space. Okay. Anyways. <laughs> talk about a tag team. Yeah, technical. Technology. So thank you very much, Karen and Mary Jo and Molly and Rod and everyone for being here with us this morning. This is great. Um, the show has been recorded and it will be available on our website. And as you can see, when you do figure out how to search for it, um, luckily so far in the world, nothing has been called Encompass Live but us. So if you just Google it, you don't even um, have to put Nebraska in here. Um, our website's the first result. So. Um, the recording for today will be posted here on our website. These are our upcoming shows. And this is where a recording will be over here. Um, here's last week's. We had our um, 
Best Books of Vermont Libraries. The recording will be here on the YouTube page. This PowerPoint presentation I'll put up, and I've already been collecting some of the links that we were talking about, the, the One Book page, um, Center for the Book, um, all those are on there. Um, so uh, when that is ready, I will let everyone know, and it'll be posted up there. Um, this afternoon, most likely, I'll get usually I get it up by the, the afternoon. You'll all be um, um, get an email letting you know. Um, so I hope you'll join us for next week's show, which is um, Innovating Access to Information with Libraries Without Borders Idea Box. Uh, Libraries Without Borders is a nonprofit organization that is doing a lot of work in um, <coughs> Foreign countries, but also in Nebraska, in in, in um, the United States, um, low-income areas, places that need this kind of um, need more help with getting um, books and computers and things. And they have this thing called the Idea Box, which places is, that don't have library service like Sarver right. County. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And they have this uh, project, the Idea Box. It, it describes a portable library and multimedia center toolkit. You can just unpack this thing, and it has computers and books and movies, and it's just kind of like a mini traveling library. And they've been doing it in foreign countries and here in the United States, and we're going to have um, someone from the group is going to be on with us. Her name. There it is, Paloma Prat Pradry. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce her name. I'll find out before next week. <laughs> um, from Libraries Above Borders will be with us on the show next week. So definitely do um, sign up for that show and any of other future ones here. We've got our July dates. Our August dates are starting to get filled. The calendar will be filled out as I confirm more things. So um, definitely sign up for anything. Also, Encompass Live is also on Facebook as well. So you can please give us a like over there. We post reminders of when our shows are coming up. Here, a reminder that I automatically sent up this morning to log in on the fly to our shows. Um, when our recordings are available, we put them up here. So um, give us a like over on Facebook if you are a big Facebook user. Other than that, that wraps up for this morning's show. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank and you, we'll Chris. See you next week on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. So long, everyone. Bye.